Hi, I'm Heidi Otway, your host for this Conversations on Cannabis virtual forum brought to you by the Medical Marijuana Education and Research Initiative at Florida a and University. In this conversation, we're talking about caregivers who support patients using medical cannabis. Our guests for today's show work directly with these individuals and will provide insights on the roles and responsibilities of cannabis caregivers. Dr. Barry Gordon is the chief medical officer and founder of one of the largest medical marijuana practices in the state of Florida. He is joined by Donna Saxe, the office manager and certified nursing assistant in his practice who supports medical marijuana patients and their caregivers. Dr. And Dr. Barry and Donna, welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit about yourselves, starting with Dr. Barry. Yeah, thanks, Heidi. Listen, it's such an honor to be with you, and I'm a fan. I've been watching a lot of the, you know, FAMU, Mary, um, you know, uh, topical, very every time, you know, events, and I'm, I'm so honored to be here today. So um, listen, I'm an emergency medicine doctor by training. I did 34 years in emergency medicine all up in Ohio. Um, Akron, Ohio, in the Northeast Ohio area. And then I was in a retirement uh, mode, so to speak, when they passed the constitutional amendment down here in Florida in, of course, November of 2016. At that point, I began to do my research about medical cannabis and how to use cannabis as medicine, became very fascinated by it, opened up my clinic in January of 2017 as the first cannabis-only clinic on the West Coast of Florida. So I didn't have an existing family practice, general practice, pain management practice. So I was able to focus all on cannabis. We were lucky. We had a lot of people waiting to see us when we opened up the clinic. And we like to think that we've developed an educational model, quite frankly, that's enabled us to sustain as a cannabis only clinic. So when our patients come to us, it's for directly that access to and education about what's really a fascinating medicine that we all need to learn more about. Yeah, and Donna's a member of your team. Donna, welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you very much. I'm more boring than Dr. Gordon is, but um, I've been in the healthcare field for a long time since I started when I was 17, going to high school. Um, I became a CNA right after I got out of high school. Um, I've worked in nursing homes, hospitals. Um, I was an administrator of a home health company and where I landed here with Dr. Gordon four years ago at the Cannabis Clinic. All right. Well, we're so glad to have you as our guest today. To everyone joining us on this live forum, please share, post, and tag a friend on Facebook to have them join us, join us for this conversation. If you're on YouTube, share the link so others can join us as well. During the forum, we want you to send us your questions in the comment box, and we'll do our best to have our guests answer them, or the Mary team will respond in the comments. We also want you to tell us what you think about this forum by completing the survey that will be posted in the comments on YouTube and Facebook after the live program. Your name will be entered into a drawing on November 4th, 2021, to win a $100 gift card provided by one of Mary's partners. So Dr. Barry and Donna, you guys have several decades of experience experience in the medical profession. And Dr. Barry, you touched on it a little bit. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how your practice has kind of evolved um, once you opened it? Sure. Well, you know, just going back to my experience as an emergency clinician, um, Heidi, and, you know, listen, when I started emergency medicine, it was back in 1981. We were just coming out of the golden hour um, learning period from the Vietnam era. You have to remember back then people were being brought into emergency rooms and hearses literally because the funeral homes ran EMS. There were no paramedics. There really yeah. wasn't an organized program. So I was kind of a pioneer back in the emergency medicine era as well. So I was very comfortable once mm -hmm. I um, learned about medical cannabis of becoming a pioneer in this new developing field as well. And re really, I like to go back to my years in the emergency medicine world. In the 35 years that I did emergency medicine, there are three things that I never did. I never put a tube down anybody's throat because of an overdose of cannabis. And of course that's, and listen, you've had a lot of discussions about the endocannabinoid system in your forums, of course. The endocannabinoid mm -hmm. system uniquely does not affect breathing, right? Or the respiratory system. So mm -hmm. narcotics, of course, benzodiazepines, alcohol alone or in combination can cause an emergency doctor to have to put a tube down your throat to assist your breathing, right? right? But never yeah. with cannabis. The second thing that I had never done, so I knew the safety was, you know, obviously, um, at least from that aspect of the worst of the catastrophic consequences. 
that mm -hmm. will never happen. The second thing was I never took care of a husband and wife or any partner team that had beaten up their partner after utilizing cannabis together, right? <laughs> it's just true. Whereas alcohol, of course, causes social destruction every day, mm -hmm. domestic and auto accidents. And that's not to say that people shouldn't drive on cannabis. Of course, we right. know better. They shouldn't. But what we see is the social destruction of alcohol, of opiates, of you know, of course, cocaine, other substances, but somehow cannabis doesn't really hit the emergency room. But the third thing, and most importantly, I never lost a friend to cannabis or the mm -hmm. child of a friend. I lost the drugs, alcohol, and you can laugh at this one, but women and gambling and tobacco, right. of course, auto accidents, suicide, depression, gun violence. So from the social consequence side, to me, cannabis was always over here. But when I did my research and learned about the possibilities of cannabis as medicine, mm -hmm. that's what's really set me forward with even more passion than when I started. Because I like to explain it simply, when I started, I was a social warrior because I knew that the prison industrial complexes were filled with people that shouldn't be there over mm -hmm. the possession of, and use of a plant, right? right. The discriminatory mm -hmm. aspects from the Nixon era decision of utilizing cannabis as his weapon in the drug war against blacks, Hispanics, mm -hmm. college students, right? And if you really go back to the history, you know that 2000 years ago, cannabis was medicine. And quite frankly, 2000 years from now, cannabis is still going to be medicine. We're just kind of stuck in 2021, which is a big pharma and a big governmental era, so to speak, controlling mm -hmm. what doctors can advise their patients. Yeah. So my point is, I came in as a social warrior, but now that I've seen what cannabis can do as medicine for my patients, it's just unbelievable to be able to offer a safe and effective medicine to patients that, quite frankly, has been so discriminated against as a simple plant for so many years. So yeah. started as a social warrior, but now I've learned what cannabis can do for patients, and we see it every single day. Yeah. And when we did our pre-interview, you know, getting ready for the show, you mentioned to me that you all have served, you know, more than 5,000 patients um, in your practice. So maybe we could shift into our conversation about cannabis caregivers, because I don't know if many people realize that in the state of Florida, that someone can provide care to a medical marijuana patient, but they have specific roles, responsibilities, and things that they have to do. So let's start our conversation here where you define what a caregiver is. Well, listen, I had to bring Donna in, um, quite frankly, because logistically and 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 paperwork, everything's by computer these days. You know, my staff, quite frankly, is much more adept at explaining the intricacies of the process yeah. itself, and, and Donna will do so. Okay. Well, what's important to know, hang on, is that from the caregiver concept standpoint, classically, the caregiver grows your cannabis for you. Is that in other states? In, in other, other states. states. Not here. Right. But not, not in here. Florida. Not, not in Florida. Florida. <laughs> Absolutely. So no. classically, Definitely if fix it. If you look at California, <laughs> Maine, Michigan, when you look at their definition of a caregiver, it's somewhat different. Right. Because that caregiver actually provides the cannabis product for that patient. So, yes, mm -hmm. of course, Interesting. in Florida, that's not true. But it's important to know why that's so important. And it is important that type of caregiver is providing exactly the product that that patient wants and needs the cultivar of that cannabis strain with mm -hmm. consistency so it's always available for that patient one of the biggest problems in the florida market these days and donna will tell you because she meets with patients as i do every day is the availability and the consistency of a product mm -hmm. when they find a cultivar be it in a inhalation form or in a gummy, whatever it may be, they want to be able to get that same product every single time. Mm -hmm. And as we say, Percocet is the same Percocet at CVS, Walgreens, or an independent pharmacy, right. but a cannabis cultivar, not quite so, right? Because of the plant itself. I was going to say that makes sense because we're talking about a plant. So it is, it is, yeah, it is. so that kind of makes sense. But a caregiver can continue to grow the same cultivar in the same way. Oh. And that can be important from the right. pesticides or lack of same, how it's processed, how mm -hmm. it's what's called flushed, right? Mm -hmm. So a caregiver from that angle is very unique, right? 
and something that if it ever comes to Florida will be either through a legislative right or perhaps a constitutional amendment form. You know, there is a constitutional amendment now pending for the ability to grow nine plants in mm -hmm. a per household. And one of the reasons, once again, is that that medical patient many times wants it done in a specific way. So I just think it's important to know that a caregiver by definition can be different just based upon the state in which you're discussing. Okay, right? so Donna's gonna tell us specifically about Florida. Indeed. <laughs> but the thing is, is that, but the thing is that caregivers fill a lot of roles. Right. They fill a physical role. Just think about a severely arthritic patient who may not even be able to open a jar, mm -hmm. right, of a gummy product, much less roll a cannabis, you know, cigarette, right? The caregiver can go into the MMTC if a patient can't verbalize, has had a stroke, of right. course. So the caregiver fills a lot of physical roles. But educationally, and we'll get into this later, educationally, we like to educate the caregiver because they need to have as much, if not more, education than the patient themselves in order right. to be successful in the program. All right. Well, let's let Donna kind of tell us what the what she's experiencing and, and her role and the definitions of a caregiver. Um, a caregiver is someone who can help the patient. Yeah. Um, many times a patient is disabled. Um, and many partners, you know, moms and dads, they work together. So mm -hmm. a patient, if they're elderly, they're not able to go inside a dispensary with their partner or their daughter. I've always helped my mom if she needed something at the store. I always went with her to the physician's office. But in a, once you receive your card and you go in a dispensary, you're not allowed to take someone in the back with you. Which oh, is crazy. It's nuts. I mean, it's not. So, so that means the caregiver can't go in the back with the individual. No, once they no. receive, if they if, if they're a caregiver, yes. But if they're not, not right. So a family be. member can't. So a family members can become caregivers. Absolutely, yes. So family what, how members. Do they, how friends. would they do that? How would they go about getting um, them? They, they have care? to actually receive a license, just as well as the patient does, exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, they need to apply, and for a caregiver, there's a test you have to take first. Oh, it's a five question test um, that makes you you have to answer a few questions. You have to mm -hmm. receive an 80 or above to pass mm -hmm. the test in order to become the caregiver to even start your license. Now, there's some other rules regarding caregivers. Uh, a, a, a person who works in an MMTC, a medical marijuana treatment center or a doctor can't be a caregiver. No, right. Let's talk about no. that. Yes, they're just not able to become caregivers for some reason because it's 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 conflict of interest because they're in that position and it's too much of a conflict. So they don't want that to mix with each other. It's like our, we're not able to sell products here either. They need to go to the dispensary. It's a conflict. Yeah, yeah right. So usually, Heidi, it's a parent for a child seizure mm -hmm. patient, autistic patient or a child for a parent who has Alzheimer's, right. dementia, the physical disability side of things. Mm -hmm. you know, Go ahead, Donna. Yeah. And also for a child, a child under the age of 18 is allowed to have two parents to be their um, right. Each, caregiver. Care, each can be a caregiver. But right. Otherwise, anyone else is only allowed one caregiver. One, one caregiver. That's really interesting. So so give me some examples, uh, Donna. You know, you're you're having you're working with these patients and you're working mm -hmm. with their caregivers. What are some of the common questions that you hear from, you know, a first time caregiver who just took a test and now they're qualified? You know, what what are the things you hear from them? Well, they need to know as much as the patient. It's very important that the caregiver is even in the room when they're going to be receiving their education. Yeah. So they know as much as the patient does because they're the one that's going to help the patient along, purchase the product. Because as Dr. Gordon was saying before, you know, if you don't get the same product all the time, sometimes when you go to pick up your, your medicine that you're using, mm -hmm. um, they do not have it in stock anymore. So they might need to get another product. Wow. So that doesn't match the product that they were using before. So they have to try to decipher what's going to be the next step that they need to purchase that product. What now, does they next. caregiver work with you and Dr. Barry, you know, and other uh, qualified physicians in the state of Florida? to kind Yes, of they do. So, uh, they'll call the practice. They'll say that, you know, the dispensary wasn't able to have this product anymore. What mm -hmm. should I get now? Um, yes, we keep our communication open with our patients always. They're welcome to come in here um, as many times as they want. They're, they need to come and see the physician every 210 days to, 
to receive their recertification. Okay. In our office, we let them know they can come a hundred times through that process before the 210 days and there's no charge. They're welcome to come to our office, give us a phone call because mm -hmm. it's a continuous education that these patients need. Things yeah. change continuously and they need that education. Yeah, Dr. Bear, touch on that education piece, especially when we're talking about products and dosing and frequency and all of that stuff. So what Donna's point is, is, is well made because typically the caregiver will come in with the patient, right? Mm -hmm. Because obviously that patient either has some degree of you know, a mental inability, right? To handle their medicine or a physical impairment. So that's the good news. What is spotty, unfortunately, and, and you know, I'm not afraid to admit it, um, and it's important that we continue to prompt change in it, is that each doctor's office needs to provide that education for patient and caregiver. Mm -hmm. And here's why, Heidi. So it's so unique in our clinic. Everybody comes wanting the same three things and for their partner or whoever they're going to be the caregiver for. They want them to feel the best that yeah. they can. That's easy but it's hard. They want to do it in the safest way that they can. Nobody wants more pharma because that's available from their regular clinician. So if they're coming to us, we know that they're attempting not to use more of what general pharma has for them. Mm -hmm. We call a win when our patients feel better. We call it a win-win when they feel better taking less of what their medicines were when they came in. And we see win-win mm -hmm. miracles also when patients come in on no pharma right mm -hmm. at the period of time they've eliminated it all but that's not our mission that's the patient's mission yeah. it's their motivation and that's what drives the clinic right is the motivation of each patient to feel the best they can under their control right pharma tends to control you when you're on an opiate or you're on an Ativan Xanax or a Wellbutrin or a Buspar you got to take those things every day and if you don't take them you know it yeah, a certain withdrawal syndrome. Cannabis, on the other hand, you learn to control and you learn to know how to utilize it for you. So to us, it's empowering patients in how to best take care of themselves. And the third thing, of course, is to be legal right. in doing so. Yes. So feel, feel, I mean, it's important. And I'll tell you why in a second. So feel the best you can in the safest, most controllable way that you can and to be legal in doing so. But here's the unique thing. Even if you have a patient later in life who may have some degree of a dementia history or a horrible physical impairment, severe arthritis. Some of those patients have used cannabis in the past. We call them doobie threes. Doobie threes are patients. Doobie ones never done. One third of our patients come in the opposite. They have never used cannabis. We love those patients. Cannabis, unfortunately, should never be the last arrow out of the quiver of the doctor for them. But it is because of how society's made it. Right. It's a taboo topic. The doobie ones tend to come in carrying the satchel of pills. They're on the fentanyl patches. They're on the Percocet. They're taking Ambien at night for sleep, Ativan, Xanax. The lids can be that high. But they're still deathly afraid of THC mm -hmm. because Nancy Reagan said no. And we've all seen the commercial. This is your brain. This is your brain on drugs with the egg frying in the pan. Right. Or they don't, they don't want to get high either. I'm sure and they don't. And they don't. And we start fundamentally with those patients by explaining how cannabis has always been medicine, but we need to learn how to use it again as medicine. Right. So doobie one's never done. Doobie twos used to do. So there's another one third, a vast pool of patients that have some degree of cannabis experience high school or college or earlier in life, but you got to give it up. Job, mm -hmm. kids, marriage. Many times you move to a different state and your safe supply of cannabis, so to speak, your high school buddy, right? He's back in the state that you were from and now you're here in Florida. So you don't have availability of cannabis. Also, we have- Well, it's also, it's illegal in Florida. You know, it the recreational, you have to have a card in Florida. You do. And that's important for our Canadians that come down for season right. and our people from other states. They have a, literally a social anxiety disorder because they're now using cannabis legally in their home states or countries. And then they come to Florida and I'm not going to send them to the legacy market to be a criminal to access unsafe product. Right. right, right. So Doobie Ones used to do Doobie, or Doobie Ones never done Doobie Twos used to do, but it's the Doobie Three 
who is comfortable with cannabis already. But the point is, is that you have to teach each individual and caregiver how to best care for that specific patient, patient right. based upon their past medical cannabis use and history. Okay. Right. And that's a key thing because we don't dose in our clinic. We teach patients how to set up that process of microdosing, or we have a jokey term for it. We call it the safe witch's brew, so to speak. Mm -hmm. That each patient, if properly educated and caregiver with that patient, can set up patch, cream, tincture oil, edible product, inhalation. They all have their uses, but you have to know how to appropriately set up the pattern. So Donna, you help them with that. Talk about that. Yes, because going back to what you said, they don't want to get high. Yeah. And that's where a caregiver mainly comes in because like Dr. Gordon was saying, we don't give a prescription, we give a recommendation. So we always start, our role is we start low and we work their way up until their comfortability level. Because if they get high, the first time that they've tried it, they're never going to try to touch it again because right. that's their main fear. Yeah. yeah. And the first lovely thing about getting them in here for someone who's 80 or 75 to come in a clinic who've never tried cannabis before, they're really frustrated with everything else that's not working for them. Right. Right. So that's We're why starting... they come here to begin with. So okay. it's kind of hard. The level they need to rise up. They need to change their product, try different things. And that's where a caregiver comes in and handy to help them do that. Because right. some patients don't know how to do that. They'll take that same thing every day. They won't raise up. They have, we explain to them how to learn how their body's feeling. It's like yeah. a Tylenol. You take it every four hours. If you start feeling pain, you usually take it in three and a half hours before the pain gets there. Um, yeah. Cannabis works almost like a pain medicine. You don't want to let it get too far off before you start feeling well, or it's going to take you a lot of time longer to get that pain under control. Yeah. So you have to learn how long it lasts, um, when to take the next dose. And that's easy. Each individual patient is different. Everyone's different. Well, that's interesting. We actually have a question from a Monica. Let's pull the question up from Monica, who's watching the show right now. She says, as a patient and a caregiver, what I find hardest is to find the right one to use, mostly for pain. How do I start? Who wants to take that question? Yeah, well, listen. Here, so the point is this. You have to know what your own specific past cannabis history use is. If you've never used cannabis before, we try to keep it simple. If you have THC, Delta 9 THC, as your main active component of cannabis, yes, it will get you high, but it's also your main effector for pain, for nausea, for tremor, for pretty much the symptoms that you're treating. But if you're new to cannabis, we're not going to send you out for a THC only product because as Donna says, the patients aren't coming to get high. So the focus is on the other cannabinoids. We have a term for it in the clinic, Heidi. We call it duality, right? THC here, CBD, and the other cannabinoids here. For the doobie, and I didn't get to the doobie four, Heidi. That would be Willie Nelson and Snoop Dogg, okay? <laughs> so the doobie fours, the, the, the doobie fours, the doobie fours are giving me more. But you know what the unique thing about them? They don't know CBD and the other cannabinoids. They're just comfortable with THC their entire right, lives. Right, and right. If you're a Vietnam veteran and you're 75 or 80 years old, it's the greatest joy for me to a free up the anxiety from their craw about their use of cannabis, right? But more importantly, to teach them to be a better cannabis consumer because they're not 18 anymore, yeah. right? So by augmenting their THC with the other cannabinoids, they become better patients too. But for the newbies as we are mostly discussing, right? They start off with THC here and the CBD products here, and they're a start low and go slow. Right, yeah, but also, slow. Not, but also it's not just mm -hmm. THC and CBD. There's CBN, CBC, CBG, mm -hmm. all of the other cannabinoids. We need more research, but mm -hmm. patients can walk into a dispensary now and buy a CBN only capsule for sleep which has nothing to do with THC and shouldn't get anybody psychoactively high, but is right. helpful for sleep. But also it's not just all the cannabinoids, but all the routes of delivery, right? right. So if you only think about the smoking of a joint or the inhaling of an in inhalable product, then you're missing out on all the other routes of administration. So right. it's that education that's key. The utilization of all the cannabinoids and all of the routes of administration. And we just call it, a safe experiment towards wellness. 
for our patients, mm -hmm. that we're going to empower you, right, so that you can make good decisions about your health, learn how these products help you. And listen, Donna made a huge point. We don't charge for follow-up visits. We charge for 210-day visits. This is my clinic's philosophy. Right. We charge for the 210-day state-required visits, but at any time, a patient is welcome to reach out to myself or any of my educators, it's, it's and, and we enjoy that. This is how we learn what's going on with our patients. Every cannabis clinician right now, Heidi, and I make a big point of this when I go to speak to doctor groups, we're all learning. I go to California and in Colorado, and I learn from doctors that have done this longer than For I. years, yeah. And then I yeah. bring them back to Florida, and I try to teach those doctors that just started out last week, right? Yeah. So we're all in a learning curve. It's an unbelievable, enjoyable learning curve. And I think it's where most of us that do this every day with passion continue to get you know that passion from it is because we're all learning. But we learn from our patients. Yeah, and that's yeah. why we always want our patients to let us know what's going on because it helps us with the next patient. Well, we have another question that came in um, going back to your comment earlier, Dr. Barry, about the disparities in uh, people of color and what's happened, you know, in the minority communities when it comes to the subject of marijuana. Mm -hmm. This one is from uh, Cannabis Collective asking, how do you create more access and equity in this space, considering the health disparities of uh, BIPOC communities? So what are you hearing when you go to these other states that have been doing this for a much longer period of time? So I can only speak for what goes on um, in, in, in my own head and in my practice. You know, I'm an active participant with Last Prisoner Project. Um, I've written letters to um, the judge in the Sean Worsley case out of Alabama, um, absolutely recognizing that I'm here practicing medicine, making a living, um, have a wonderful staff doing things that people are still literally in jail over, you know, and we see that every day. So to me, it's an effort that you have to undergo in each and every state. It has to start at the federal level. And we're going to, you know, get into this and it's probably a good time to get into it now. Until things change at the federal level, Heidi, we're going to continue to have access issues into our nursing homes, our assisted living centers, okay, places where that caregiver status can be very, very difficult, right? Mm -hmm. so, oh, absolutely. Very so, hard. So many really? nursing home patients, oh, yes. assisted living patients want to use medical cannabis, but until certain things change at the federal funding level and things like that. So to me, it's an effort... And I, I like to say, listen, I'm a glass half full type of guy. So I know where we started four and a half years ago. The boulder was literally that big. We've chopped it down pretty good. We continue to hammer away at the rock. But these are issues that are critical. We need minority and legacy participation. We need to correct past social ills. Um, we need to make sure that expungements are taken care of as we go forward. These things don't happen without an active advocate community in each and every state. And here's the good news. We have a group of doctors, literally, Heidi, that meets every other Wednesday, okay, planning for the legislative session. As you know, the legislative session in Florida this year will be January through March, but now is when they're crafting next year's legegislation. Right, the policy, right? yeah. First thing we need to take care of is job protections for people that are still in the workforce, right? Yeah. Absolutely, positively. It, we need a universal impairment scale, not a THC screen for, you know, um, a urine screen for cannabis. I mean, if you're a frontline healthcare worker, and listen, it's an interesting conversation, and it has to do with being a caregiver. If you're a frontline healthcare worker right now, and you're working in an ICU or a ER environment, literally anybody in the hospital setting, you're having to do two things right now that no healthcare worker ever wants to have to do again, and they can't believe they're doing it now. Taking care of way too many people that are needlessly and dying too young, you know, not to get overly political about it, but, you know, vaccination, it's been a, it's been a problem, and we've seen Delta variant come back. But they're also holding the hands of these patients while they're dying because families literally can't come in and visit these patients. No healthcare workers prepared for that. They're not trained for that. I'm a tough guy. I did emergency medicine for 35 years. I still remember every almost every time I had to walk into a family room to tell a family member that their teenage son was dead from an auto mm -hmm. accident, wow. you know, suicide, whatever it may be. Yeah. Our healthcare workers are also intelligent, Heidi, and 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 I've spoken to this recently up in Tallahassee. They don't want alcohol. 
they don't want Ambien or Xanax or Wellbutrin or Prozac to help them with their questionable, and you can call it what you want, PTSD symptomatology after COVID. Many of our healthcare workers are going to carry this period of time with them for a long time. They're using cannabis already because they don't want the other substances. And we need to get the knife of anxiety out of the craw of our first responders, our paramedics, our in-hospital workers, our social workers, our teachers. Anybody that needs a licensure or job protections needs to know that the utilization appropriately of cannabis is acceptable. And that may be one of the keys as we go towards legal adult use or rec, Heidi, mm -hmm. is that maybe the holder of a medical card gets those protections. And right. maybe the person who just has a rec card doesn't. Maybe the medical card is allowed to have a caregiver who can grow those plants for him. Right. And maybe the recreational patient isn't. No taxes in Florida is key, right? And maybe we keep that in medical. So the point is, is that we're very proactive in getting a very long answer to your simple question. We're very proactive in Florida right now to make sure as we go forward that we try to take care of a lot of these different issues. Yeah, yeah. Well, that you, you talked about the medical profession and, and medical them actually getting a medical marijuana card to treat a qualifying condition, which is PTSD, which, you know, people have been experiencing since the pandemic. So before every show, we ask people to send in questions about uh, that they want to ask of you. And so this is one from someone that is, says, hey, I'm interested in learning how nurses can be trained to work in the medical marijuana field. So basically what I'm hearing is, you know, we have caregivers that are either wanting to use medical marijuana legally in Florida, or they want to help people. So let's talk about that. Well, listen, I told you in the pre-show that I have a great answer for this because I love it. I actually have a whole lecture set up. It's called how to talk to your doctor about medical cannabis, right? And I speak to all my nurses in this way. When you go to your doctor, your doctor, your personal doctor, you don't need to out yourself if you're in the medical cannabis program already. Just keep the questions simple and general. Okay. Do you have any patients in the medical cannabis program, right? You don't have to say any other patients, any patients. That opens the door for your doctor to give you one of three answers. First answer, we don't hear it very often anymore, but we used to hear it all the time was, who would do that? That's a drug. It's pot. It's no <laughs> weed, right? Don't even want to talk about it. Don't want to think about it. Then right. you know what? If you're a patient already, you're going to shut your mouth. Right. And if you're not a patient, that's probably not a doctor that you as a nurse would want to work with in a medical cannabis way. The second answer, and it's one we hear much more commonly these days, is you know what? My hospital system won't let me do it. My attorney mm -hmm. has advised me against it. I have four partners. I'm the only one that wants to do it. But I do believe in medical cannabis. I wasn't taught it in med school. And I'd like to know more than if you're a talented, educated nurse, you can pull an article out of your pocket and you can say, listen, I've done some reading about it and here's a start for you. It's about the endocannabinoid system and this and that, right? The third answer and the one I like also, of course, would be, you know what? I can't do it, but I know that Dr. Barry, you know, a couple doors down, he does it the best and he'll educate you, right? So the point is a nurse can talk to their own healthcare provider and offer that healthcare provider knowledge, education, information, and also can be the nurse that allows that practitioner to open up a cannabis wing to his practice, right? No doctor can do this alone. I'm, I'm so grateful that I have my staff that assists me in what I do. Every doctor needs a checkpoint with the OMU, the medical marijuana. Yeah, you know, obviously medical marijuana. Use the yeah. paperwork. Yeah. To answer these questions. And we're going to put the paper, we're going to put a link in the, in the chat here. Absolutely. So everybody needs that logistical person, but every doctor also needs an educator, right? Yeah. And yeah. nurses can fill that role, can fill that role in a fantastic way. It'd be helpful. It, it's, a it, it's a gratifying. Um, so would nurses be considered caregivers and have to go through the same process as a, a doctor who's becoming qualified in the state of Florida? Not to, not to work in an office, but mm -hmm. listen, you know, if you want to become a caregiver. But the, the unfortunate thing is you can't do it for multiple patients, right? Oh, so, you, know, you can't be a caregiver. So, so can nope. and I have a question here from someone saying, can a nurse be a caregiver? Yeah, a nurse can absolutely be a caregiver. <laughs> right, but what you're saying is or their parent. But they can't person. do it for the uh, a true patient. 
Not their patient. If they have a friend and they're a nurse, they can be a caregiver for that friend. Oh. But not for any of if, if it's their patient. No. So okay. for example, Heidi, one one way to solve the and it's a huge problem in the assisted living world and in the nursing home world. So many of these patients would benefit from the utilization. Yeah, that's of one of the campus. questions we have here. A simple thing would just be to have a caregiver status for each facility or nursing home so that they could assign one nurse or one or two nurses to be the providers, the caregivers. I mean, once again, and it's funny too, because one of the big things that we are all waiting to see how it comes down is in hospital use of cannabis. So that's another thing. If you're a holder of a medical card, you should, and we should want you to be able to go into the hospital and tell your doctor, your surgeon, your anesthesiologist that you're a medical cannabis card holder, right? It's safer that way. Everybody should want to know. But in the post-op period of time, you can keep your Percocet to yourself, okay? I want to use my medicine, right? And it's funny, unless you instruct hospital administrators, they think that it's going to be a patient smoking a joint in their hospital right, bed. Right, They don't know about the tinctures and the patches and the other means of safely administering cannabis and not affecting anybody else in the hospital, right? Right. So, so what I'm hearing you say is time. that I'm hearing you say that a patient going into a hospital can take their medical cannabis product and they have to advocate for it to be used instead of a pharma? We don't yeah. have that yet. That's we don't have that in Florida. Okay, so this not. you're talking about an ideal scenario. Yes. Okay. No, no, no. I like to clarify so no, that yes. you know, the listeners don't think, oh, I'm going to yeah. take and that. And that's where the picture. assisted living, too. Um, there's a few assisted livings that allow a patient to utilize cannabis, but it's right. not easy because right. they need to order it for themselves. It has to be delivered because if they don't have a right to go pick it up. Well, that goes to if they have a caregiver, too. Correct. Right? And if they're not able to because it's not a prescribed medicine, you know, doctors usually, if you have a home health aid, they want a prescription because or they won't fill a med box. So there's a lot of rules that are right. in guidelines that it's very difficult. If a patient calls up and they don't have their, say, even if the doctor says, take this and this and the home allows it, then they go to purchase it next month and they don't have it in stock. Then the physician needs to write for something else. So it's a process that keeps very busy. I'm on the phone an awful lot with yeah. them patients because it's just, it's very difficult for them. We manage them. We make it work. Our office goes above and beyond, but it's not easy. It's very, you know, you're, you're, you have to be on it at all times. Yeah. So what I'm hearing in this conversation for anyone who is, you know, trying to, you know, really wrap the things that they could do to take advantage of the information shared today is number one, you want to work with your qualified medical doctor, you know, in the cannabis space, like a Dr. Barry, you yeah. want to leverage the education and the resources and the support of the nursing staff like Donna. Yeah. And then also if there's any kind of confusion, you know, a resource that they could go to would be the Florida department of health office of medical marijuana use that lays out the rules and regulations and the laws regarding medical marijuana in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah, and listen, I speak to this um, in general, Heidi. We are lucky to have what we have in Florida. If we did not vote on this back in 2016 as a constitutional amendment, we'd be waiting along with every other Southern state, okay, mm -hmm. for a program like this to come along. Yeah. We started here in Florida with oils, right? We didn't have flour to start, which was right. a great thing for medical cannabis clinicians like me because it forced me to learn about the other cannabinoids. It forced me to learn about the ratios and that duality concept, right? So that should be required. If you're going to be, you know, pers you know, recommending it, it makes sense that all doctors would, would be as knowledgeable as you have done, you know? Unfortunately, believe it or not, the only requirement in the state of Florida to be a medical cannabis provider is a two hour state course. Mm -hmm. Two hour state course, unfortunately, mm -hmm. does not even mention the endocannabinoid system. Mm -hmm. Very much like the five um, five questions on the caregiver test, right? Donna? Right. right. Yes. Which means you got to get four of them right to get the 80%. That's right. <laughs> oh my God. I, seriously, even in that test for caregivers, mm -hmm. there's nothing that discusses the endocannabinoid system or the caregiver's knowledge of cannabis. Yeah. It's really just about legalities. Mm -hmm. and that's the same for the two hour doctor course as well. Mm -hmm. So doctors in general need to be self-taught um, society of cannabis clinicians and other excellent groups.
Yeah. Here in Florida, we meet, like I said, every other Wednesday. We tend to have an educational focus for the first half hour. So we we take pride in making sure that we're trying to bring the best education that we can, you know, here to the state. But it varies from clinic to clinic. And, and that's why you need to research. You need yeah. to ask questions. Mm-hmm. Um, don't go to Facebook to get your answers about medical cannabis. Demand that your that your medical cannabis doctor and staff um, take care of the, the, the questions. That, that That's the right way to go. Mm-hmm. And listen, it's it's safe. It's safe, but it's not, you know, um, without some degree of consequences. We don't mm-hmm. want our elderly getting weak and dizzy and nauseated and, and getting high to the extent right. that they get fear, you know, and, and get scared off what we know can be ultimately beneficial for them. Yeah. It's not a miracle. We never give guarantees no. that you're going to leave here and you're going to be wonderful. But when it works and patients are patient, oh, the marvelous things we see here. Yeah. Really, every day it, 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 is wonderful. Absolutely. It's not like it's a process and, you know, they have to work collectively with their doctor, their caregiver oh, yes, and, absolutely. and the resources out there, the credible resources, you know, like this program here brought to you by the Medical Marijuana Re- Education and Research Initiative mm-hmm. at, you know, one of the top HBCUs in the country. So, it's, you know, there are resources out there. We have another question that kind of aligns with the conversation we just had, and it's from Brianna Journey asking about dispensaries employing a farm d what do we need to do in florida to make sure patients going to dis- dispensaries are receiving medical counseling from a pharmacist to ensure safe and effective use and dosing great question brianna absolutely and i see the picture which means that she's probably achieved doctor yeah. you know, being a pharmacist fantastic listen in many states the pharmacists actually run the program so my daughter works up in New York for Cresco, which is Sunnyside down here in Florida. The pharmacist in New York is the only one that can actually dispense the cannabis product. In Maryland also, in Minnesota, the pharmacists are very active in the dispensary world. Mm-hmm. There is a program at the University of Maryland at the master's level, which is teaching cannabinoid medicine. So the pharmacy world is going to be very much more active as we go forward um, with medical cannabis. Florida does not have that requirement to have a pharmacist um, in the MMTC, in the dispensaries. But I think in general, um, it, it's, it's a good thing to have. And the advice of a pharmacist can be very helpful. Here's the good thing about medical cannabis in general, though. Drug-drug interactions are extremely minimal. Doesn't mean we don't think about it. We don't advise about it. But in general, only Coumadin or Warfarin would necessitate a focus on what's called the INR, getting your blood, you know, checked a little bit more frequently, because like any green leafy vegetable, you can have an elevation of that INR. But for narcotics and benzodiazepines and all the SSRIs, in general, with good education and moderate use, we really don't see significant drug-drug interactions. So the pharmacists can be extremely helpful, and in many states they are an integral part, but not yet here in Florida. Okay, all right. Well, that was a loaded question, a response from you, Brianna. But as a pharmacist, I know you understood every mm-hmm. term he yeah. used. Yeah. So, Dr. Yeah, Barry, I yeah, I was going to say, was there anything else you wanted to add? There is. I want to bring up two specific um, uh, patient groups. One is the Alzheimer's patient here in Florida. Unfortunately, dementia and Alzheimer's is not included in the qualifying conditions here in the state of Florida. They are not. And also autism, right, is also not included um, as one of the qualifying conditions here Mm -hmm. in Florida. However, and especially I wanted to bring it up in the caregiver discussion that we're having today. Parents, of course, are the primary caregivers for their autistic children. Mm -hmm. One thing that I learned in my many years in the emergency medicine biz is this. Nobody knows their special needs child better than the mom and the dad themselves. Mm -hmm. Nobody. And I can spend countless hours and meetings and this and that, but they're always going to know their child best. The second thing I assume, unless there's a Munchausen by proxy or something along those lines, every parent of an autistic child wants what's best for their child, right? For their child to achieve the best they can, to be as safe as they can, the medicines that they shove at these autistic kids are unbelievable medicines that I surely would not want my child on if they didn't need to be. Right. So parents have now become educated in what they want. And if they're stuck in Florida, right, 
and they want to try cannabis, even a CBD product, okay, it's very important to do that appropriately. Even a CBD product, Children's Protective Services, things of that nature, you need to do it right. And we're not even talking THC. Right. Okay? But in the autistic world, there is a huge body of literature coming from other countries, mostly Israel primarily, that shows that the cannabinoids in general can be extremely helpful for autistic kids, right? Mm -hmm. So it's very important to know how to take care of that parent. And to me, listen, if you're a parent of a child who's on a Respiradol or a, you know, Clonopin or any of the other medicines that they may use for agitation, you know, whatever it may be, and you want to try cannabis, even if it's just a CBD only product, make sure you do it right. Go in and find yourself a cannabis clinician who's willing to advocate for you. Because here's my point. We have PTSD, and this goes to Alzheimer's too. We have PTSD and similar likewise or as comparable conditions to PTSD. Mm -hmm. any, any child that has autism or any adult that has Alzheimer's, they all have some degree of depression, anxiety, sleep disorder. Okay, so to me an advocate physician will utilize that similar likewise or as comparable to meet that patient's needs. Mm -hmm. I like to call that being a 2021 doctor in 2021 and not a 1981 doctor when I started my healthcare career. If I didn't use my 40 years of clinical experience to advocate for that parent of an autistic child, or that child of an Alzheimer's demented patient, mm -hmm. quite frankly, I, I couldn't look myself in the mirror to know that there may be a safer alternative and or adjunct to the medicines that that patient's already on, mm -hmm. right? And and we may be able to, to diminish their pharma burden. Maybe yes, maybe no, but the safety of cannabis with the appropriate education allows me to look parents children, politicians, other doctors in the face and say, it's all about the education. Right. I know politicians and doctors that don't understand what I do is if all you understand is THC and you don't know the other cannabinoids and all you know about is the smoking of a joint and you don't know about all the other means of administration, then you're stuck in the 60s and you're not a 2021 practitioner because 20% of your patients are probably using cannabis already, either in the legacy market illegally or they're in the right. medical program and they just haven't even told you yet. Right. So to me, every doctor, every practitioner needs to at least get educated about the endocannabinoid system so that they can appropriately answer questions that are going to be coming from every patient, whether right. they're in the program or not. Yeah, well, I would like to encourage, you know, any listener that's curious to learn more about the endocannabinoid system, please go to Mary's uh, YouTube channel, Mary Form Radio. We've had a number of doctors come in and actually explain the endocannabinoid system, how it works, the CB receptors and all of the ways that it works within the body. And it's mm -hmm. something that's kind of new that was discovered in the 1990s, is my understanding. Well, so Dr. Mishulam, Dr. Mishulam is over my shoulder there. You see um, Harry Anslinger, and he, of course, was the villain. And then there's my picture with Dr. Mishulam, who I was honored to meet out in California a couple of years ago. He, he literally discovered the endocannabinoid system. And he's still out there. He should get the Nobel Prize for medicine, quite frankly. And I, and right. I hope he does before he passes. Well, we only have a few minutes left. And I wanted to find out, Dr. Barry, Donna, do you all want to share any closing thoughts for our listeners and viewers here regarding cannabis caregivers in Florida? Well, yes. If anyone is interested in just learning anything, just if they need any questions answered, they're able to call our clinic. We'll be happy to answer any questions that they might have. Even if they're not our patients, we always help, we, you know, Advice is good for anyone. And right. if need be, our office is willing to help anyone. Any and your website has some really good resources as well, including an article about cannabis caregivers. Mm -hmm. uh, and your website, Dr. Barry? Yeah, it's uh, venicecare.com. And mm -hmm. the clinic is the Compassionate Cannabis mm -hmm. Clinic of Venice. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a second office down in Fort Myers that's run by Dr. Heather Ald, who's an unbelievably fantastic clinician as well. But, you know, we don't have eight centers, um, Heidi, because mm -hmm. to me, it's about the educational focus. And mm -hmm. I just can't find eight Donnas or right. eight, you know, staffs, seriously, like I have here. So, you know, we, we, we like to take the focus to the other extent. And just my closing comments will be, listen, 
we're all pulling on the rope together. And, and it, when the power and the money are sometimes over here, we have the plant itself and, and the stories of our patients and, and the power of the plant itself. And that's why it was such an honor. And I was so eager to join you today because I view you as critical towards us continuing to pull on that rope together from the educational focus. Cannabis, once again, has always been a medicine, right? And we just have to make sure that it's properly understood as medicine. And you know what? We're ultimately going to go to the next step in Florida. We'll get to legal adult use in Florida, but that also needs to be done appropriately with safety, with yeah. education, with the appropriate labeling and testing. So, you know, like I said, I'm a glass half full type of guy. And because of the efforts of organizations like yours and yourself, Heidi, and quite frankly, my staff assisting me in what I do, as well as many other fantastic clinicians around the state, my point to patients is find one, do your homework, and utilize your medical cannabis clinician and those in his office, his or her office um, that can assist you in obtaining your goals. We never overpromise. That's what Donna said earlier. Right. But we always, but that's the key to medicine in general is the appropriate expectations. Right. But we always promise the best of the education that we can provide the patient mm -hmm. and the safety of our product. And, and those are pretty um, two pretty darn good um, guarantees. Well, Dr. Barry and Donna, thank you all so much for being guests on this Conversations thank on you. Cannabis it's Virtual Forum, <laughs> which was brought to you today by the Medical Marijuana Research and Education Initiative at Florida a and University. Thank you to everyone watching this program. Tell us what you think about the forum by completing the survey that will be posted in the comment boxes on YouTube and Facebook after this live program. If you complete the survey, your name will be entered into a drawing on November 4th, 2021 to win a $100 gift card provided by one of Mary's partners. We also want to encourage everyone to go to the Florida Department of Health Office of Medical Marijuana Use website to learn how to legally obtain a medical marijuana card in the state of Florida. We also encourage you to go to the Florida a and University's Mary website to learn more about this initiative, its educational programs, and additional information about cannabis use in Florida. We've also placed a link to Dr. Barry's practice in the comments, so you can go there to reach out to them. Thanks, everyone. Great show. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Heidi. You. Stay healthy. Be well. Thanks,